Over 400 years ago, people from England started to cross the Atlantic Ocean to build colonies in America. The first successful English colony was founded in 1607 in what is today the state of Virginia. It was named Jamestown in honor of the king. Thirteen years later, in 1620, the English colony of Plymouth was begun along the shore of Cape Cod Bay in what is today the state of Massachusetts. The people who founded these colonies brought the customs, language, laws, and religions of England to North America. And by doing so, helped to create the culture of what later became the United States of America. Once they settled in America, the Jamestown and Plymouth colonists had to change many of their old English ways of doing things to make them work in a new land that was so strange to them. Some of these changes had to do with how they farmed and lived their daily lives, while other changes had to be made in their laws and how they governed themselves. The colonies of Plymouth and Jamestown were founded for very different reasons, but even so, their colonists faced many of the same problems, and they suffered similar hardships starting new lives for themselves in America. Now let us learn more about how these two colonies began and how people lived back then. It was in England late in the year of 1606 that the story of Jamestown begins as sailors got three ships ready to take 104 men and boys across the Atlantic Ocean to the wilderness called Virginia. In Virginia, they planned to start an English colony, search for gold, and try to find a new route to Asia. When the ships sailed out of the harbor into the Atlantic Ocean, many of the passengers were sad, and they were worried about the long voyage ahead of them. But by the spring of 1607, after a four and a half month voyage, the ships finally reached the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. They lowered their anchors and began to explore. After a while, they found an island in the James River where they thought they should build their colony. It wasn't long before some of the men got to work cutting down trees for lumber. After a lot of hard work, small houses started to take shape. They built walls by filling the spaces between the wooden beams with woven branches and mud, and they made roofs from reeds that grew in the nearby swamps. When they were done, the houses of Jamestown looked a lot like those they had known in England. But most of them had only one room. As time went by, the colonists also built barns where they could store supplies. And they built a new church where they were required to worship twice a day. They even sharpened logs to make a wall all the way around the first town, or fort as they called it, to protect it from attacks by hostile tribes and from the Spanish colonies that lay to the south. Most of the work of building Jamestown was done by the poorer colonists. The other half of the colonists were wealthy members of England's upper class, who, according to the old English ways of doing things, were not expected to work. This caused many bad feelings at the colony. But that was just one problem Jamestown faced. Another was that it was built on swampy land that was bad for farming. Most of the drinking water was no good. The swamps were filled with disease-carrying mosquitoes. And because of these things, as well as starvation, 
around 440 out of 500 colonists had died by the spring of 1610. It is not surprising that Jamestown almost failed, not only because of the illness and starvation, but because no gold had been discovered and because the colonists hadn't found any good ways of making a living. But just when they were the most discouraged, new people came from England and they settled on healthier lands where they could farm. The Jamestown colonists were led for many years by this man, Captain John Smith. He was an excellent governor, as well as an explorer and map maker. Smith put the upper class colonists to work. He kept everyone from starving by buying corn from the Native Americans, and also by learning how they hunted for food. One day, while John Smith was out exploring, he was captured and threatened with death by warriors from an unfriendly tribe, only to be saved by the chief's daughter, Pocahontas. Later, she married one of the colonists and began dressing like an Englishwoman. Her husband, a plantation owner named John Rolfe, had worked for years developing a mild, sweet kind of tobacco. The English settlers in Virginia started raising lots of tobacco plants, and they grew quite well. After the leaves were harvested and dried, the tobacco was shipped off to Europe, where the dangerous habit of smoking was just becoming popular. As the years passed, tobacco farming brought the colony great prosperity. On July 30th, 1619, the people of Jamestown elected an assembly of men called the House of Burgesses to make laws for their growing colony. That turned out to be a very important day because it was the beginning of representative government in America. While the colonists of Jamestown were starting their own government, the pilgrims were working out plans for coming to America. The pilgrims were a group of people who had broken away or separated themselves from the Church of England, which was the religion to which most English people, including the Jamestown colonists, belonged. That was why, 400 years ago, the pilgrims were called separatists. What made them so different from most other English people was that they wanted to have a simple religion of their own. They wanted their services to be as plain as possible. They didn't want stained glass windows or religious statues in their churches. And they wanted everyone to follow strict rules. When the pilgrims still lived in England, they began to have services in private homes such as the one seen here. But then their new ruler, King James I, forbid all private religious services. That was why many pilgrims had to leave the peaceful countryside and small villages where they had lived all their lives and try to find religious freedom in other lands. At first the pilgrims moved to Holland, but after a few years some of them decided to start a colony in America. By late in the summer of 1620, a ship called the Mayflower was just about ready to take the colonists across the ocean. The ship was being loaded with things that would be needed for the new colony and for the voyage, such things as furniture, plates, jugs, extra shoes, and many barrels filled with water, beer, and food were taken aboard for the voyage. Beds were prepared so the passengers would have places to sleep, and a small boat like this one was taken apart and stored inside the ship 
so it could be used later on for exploring in shallow waters. Finally, everything was ready, and in September of 1620, 102 passengers found their places below the main deck, and the Mayflower set sail for America. As it turned out, less than one half of the future colonists on the Mayflower were pilgrims. All the rest were members of the Church of England. At first, the Mayflower sailed along smoothly, but as time passed, it grew stormy crossing the Atlantic Ocean, and with so many people jammed into such a small space, everyone was pretty miserable. The voyage took over two months, and because the ship was blown off course, it sailed further north than expected. When the colonists finally saw land, they discovered that they were just off of Cape Cod in New England, and not in Virginia, where they had planned to go. At that time, New England had no laws, so before anyone went ashore, 41 men on the ship elected a governor and signed a paper we now call the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact said that they agreed to make and obey all just and equal laws that would be in the overall best interest of their new colony and not favor one religious group over another. This turned out to be a very important event because it was the beginning of democracy in America. Most of us have probably heard that the pilgrims landed here at Plymouth Rock, but no one knows for sure if this really happened. We do know that while they were anchored in Cape Cod Bay, the colonists put together the boat that had been stored on the Mayflower, and they started to search for a place to settle. After a while, they decided to build their new colony on a wooded hillside, in a place that Captain John Smith had named Plymouth, when he explored New England a few years earlier. Late in December of 1620, the colonists started building. During that time, they stayed on the Mayflower, even though it was quite cold and damp. By the time winter ended, half of them had died due to poor living conditions and disease. But through a lot of hard work, those who survived were soon able to create a successful community. The arrival of more people from England caused the Plymouth colony to grow so that by 1627, a small town of over 150 people now stood, where only seven years before, there had been mostly forest. In America, the Plymouth colonists hoped to find more independence and better lives than those they had known in England. At first, many colonists thought they could improve their lives by becoming fishermen, but they soon discovered they couldn't make a living at fishing alone. Even at that, a lot of what they ate came from the sea, and the colony even managed to ship some extra fish back to England. The people of Plymouth had to catch or grow everything they ate. That was why a large part of each day was either spent working in the fields and pastures, taking care of animals, or gathering and preparing food. At Plymouth, the Native Americans had taught them how to grow corn, and that was their best crop. But the colonists also raised all kinds of vegetables in their gardens. They depended on their cattle for both milk and meat. They raised pigs, goats, chickens, and sheep. And in the nearby forests, 
They gathered berries, trapped for furs, and hunted for wild game. America's huge forests provided the Plymouth colony with so much timber that there was enough extra to send back to England. Like Jamestown, the houses of Plymouth were small and cozy. Whole families slept, cooked, and ate in just one room. And also like Jamestown, Plymouth was protected by tall walls of sharpened logs and was guarded by a fort as well. In the top part of the fort, cannons stood ready to defend the colony from attack, while downstairs was a room where the colony's meetings and religious services were held. On Sundays, no one was allowed to work, and everybody came here to listen to sermons that could be many hours long. Except for Sundays, Plymouth was quite a busy place where the colonists did all the ordinary everyday things they needed to do to stay alive and well. Whether it was carrying lumber to repair a building, raking out a pen, digging post holes for fences, working in the fields, raising the children, or keeping the house neat and tidy. And by doing simple tasks like these day after day, the people of Plymouth slowly created a colony where they not only had religious freedom, but where they were able to lead lives that were much better than those they had known in England. As we have just learned, Plymouth and Jamestown were the first two English colonies in America. They were very important because not only did the colonists bring the customs, language, laws, and religions of England to North America, they also helped to plant the seeds of democracy and independence in the American soil. True or false, Captain John Smith was the first governor of the Plymouth Colony. True or false, the Jamestown colonists came to America to find religious freedom. True or false, in 1620, the pilgrims were known as separatists. True or false, many of the Plymouth colonists died during their first winter in America. True or false, the pilgrims had strict religious beliefs. 